It's often said that this election represents a defining moment in our history on, on major issues like the war in Iraq or uh, the warming of the planet. The decisions that we make in November are going to have an impact not just on us, but on generations to come. And that's especially true when it comes to our economy, because most of you probably know this, uh, not just because of what it says in the newspapers or what you're seeing on TV, uh, but because you're experiencing it in your own lives. Uh, we've had more job losses, more foreclosures, prices rising at the pump. Uh, you feel the effects of this every day. We've lost 468,000 jobs since January. We've had more home foreclosures than at any time since the Great Depression. You're working harder than ever to pay the bills, and the bills are getting bigger than ever. You're driving less. You're saving less. You're struggling to balance work and family. You're worried about the value of your home and whether you're going to be able to afford college for your children and still retire at a decent age. And for millions of people, millions of families all across America, these anxieties seem to be growing with each passing day, causing many people to lose faith in the fundamental promise of America, which is that if you work hard, if you do what you're supposed to do, then not only can you live a good life, but you can pass on a better life to your children and your grandchildren. That's the essence of the American dream. That's the essence of the American dream, that you can make it if you try, and that your children are going to do better than you did. Now, part of the reason that people are struggling is because of fundamental changes in the economy. And we've got to recognize that the economy has shifted and it has changed. Over the last few decades, you've had a revolution in technology and communication so that corporations can send jobs anywhere where there's an internet connection. And other countries have been catching up. They've been investing in, in education for their young people and in, in their infrastructure. So you've got countries like China and India and Brazil that can now compete in ways that they couldn't just a few years ago, which means that children here in Missouri, they're not just competing against uh, young people in California or Florida. They're now competing against kids in Beijing and Bangalore for the same jobs which means that we've got a more difficult environment economically than we've had in the past. What we also have to remember is that it wasn't just globalization, it wasn't just technology that put us in the situation that we're in right now. It was also irresponsible decisions that were made in Washington and that were made on Wall Street. And And part of what we've learned is that you can't separate what's good for ordinary American families and what's good for the economy as a whole. You can't have Wall Street doing well and Main Street doing poorly and think that the economy is going to move forward. That's not how it works. Even when the economy was going well under George Bush, when it was growing and productivity was increasing and people were working harder, you know what? The average American wage, the average American income for a family was either flatlined or going down. The average American family has lost $1,000 worth of purchasing power over the last seven, eight years. Think about that. The economy was growing, corporate profits were up, stock market was high, but most families, when it came to actually what they could buy with their paychecks, they were buying $1,000 less worth of stuff. And that just shows you that when wages are flat and prices are rising and more and more Americans are mired in debt, the economy as a whole suffers. When a reckless few game the system, as we've seen in the housing crisis where banks were 
giving out predatory loans, engaging in deceptive practices, inducing people to purchase homes with no money down and interest rates that looked like they were low when it turned out that, in fact, they were going to increase in a few months or in a few years. When people game the system like that, everybody suffers. When special interests put their thumbs on the scale a little too heavily and distort the free market so that you've got tax breaks to companies that are shipping jobs overseas, everybody suffers. When government fails to meet its obligations for basic oversight to make sure that the system is working in a way that's fair and transparent for all Americans, then everybody suffers. America pays a heavy price. So we've got a choice in this election. We can either choose a new direction, or we can keep on doing the same things that we've been doing. We can keep on doing the same things we've been doing. Now, my opponent, John McCain, thinks that we're basically on the right track. He does. Uh, you know, he said that our economy has great, uh, made great progress in the last eight years. He has embraced the Bush economic policies and promises to continue them. Same policies as George Bush. He wants to continue the Bush tax cuts for the wealthy, and he wants to put another $300 billion worth of tax cuts on the table for corporations. Why not small businesses? Because he thinks it's okay the way things are going right now. Let me tell you, we can't afford to keep on doing more of the same, and that's why I'm running for President of the United States of America. The policies we've been, we've been implementing over the last eight years, they haven't been working for ordinary families, and they're not going to work now. Uh, we need to leave those policies in the past, where they belong. We need something new. It's time to restore some balance and some fairness to the economy so it works for all Americans, so that we are lifting up Main Street, and that will benefit Wall Street. And it starts by giving immediate relief to families who are one illness or one foreclosure or a pink slip away from disaster, to help people who are having trouble filling up the gas tank or, or looking at groceries going up by 30 percent over the last few months, to help hardworking Americans meet rising costs, I'm going to put a $1,000 tax cut into the pockets of every working American family that is, is uh, has just a, a normal income, 95% of Americans will get a tax break under my plan of up to $1,000, and that includes 3 million folks right here in Missouri. And to help... <laughs> to help end this housing crisis, I want to give additional tax deductions, mortgage interest rate deductions, to homeowners who are not currently receiving them to protect retirement security. I've said that if you're a senior citizen and you're making $50,000 a year or less, you won't have to pay income tax on your Social Security because you're already struggling to meet rising costs right now. So, so if Senator McCain wants to debate taxes, yeah, then I'm ready. I, I, I was just reading, I, I was just reading that uh, while Bill Hicka, uh, he, he had the first duel in, in, the t in the town square here in, in Springfield. And I don't know if people are aware of the fact that, now, I have not done all the full research on this, but, but the, the family legend is, is that while Bill Hickok, he's a distant cousin of mine. I'm serious. I'm serious. I'm serious. This is part of the family legend. I don't know if it's true, but that's the legend. So, so we're going to research that because I'm ready to duel John McCain on taxes right now, right here.
<laughs> I'm a quick draw. Because while we're both proposing tax cuts, there's a big difference in terms of who the tax cuts are for. McCain would cut taxes for those making over $3 million. One quarter of John McCain's tax cuts would go to people making millions of dollars. I'll cut tax cut, I, I want to uh, cut taxes for middle class families, ordinary folks who are working hard and playing by the rules. And an objective analysis done by a nonpartisan group has shown that my tax cut would benefit middle class families three times as much as John McCain's. You know, so let me be clear, because you're, you're going to start seeing ads. This is what happens every election season. They're going to say, oh, he's a tax and spend liberal Democrat. He wants to, he wants to get in your pocket. He's going to spending on all kinds of crazy pork barrel project. You know, I mean, you've seen the ads. They, they just replace the name each election cycle, but it's the, <laughs> it's the same ad over and over again. So let me be absolutely clear. If you are a family making less than $250,000 a year, <laughs> if you are a family making two, less than $250,000 a year, you will not see your taxes go up. Not your capital gains tax, not your payroll tax, not your income tax, no taxes. Your taxes will not go up. And by the way, unlike John McCain, I'll pay for my plan by cutting wasteful spending and shutting corporate loopholes and tax havens, and rolling back the Bush tax cuts for some of the wealthiest Americans in the country. But in this election, we're going to have to do more than just provide some short-term relief. We've got to put our economy on a long-term path to economic growth, a long-term path for competitiveness in the 21st century. And it's not going to be easy. And it's not going to happen overnight. And those who will tell you that it's going to happen overnight just aren't telling you the truth. We're, we're going to have to work our way out of the pickle that we've been put in here. Uh, but I refuse to accept the idea that we can't do it. I am absolutely confident uh, that we can choose our own economic destiny. We can choose another four years with the same reckless fiscal policies that George Bush has implemented, taking our national debt from $5 trillion to over $9 trillion in the span of ten, uh, eight years, uh, mortgaging our children's future on a mountain of debt, or we can restore some fiscal responsibility in Washington. We can, yes we can. We can go for another four years with a broken health care system that is more expensive than just about any other system on earth, even though 47 million people still don't have health insurance. And if you've got health insurance, what's been happening? You've seen your co-payments and your deductibles and your premiums going up and up and up. We could keep on doing the same thing, or we can finally decide we're going to fix this thing by cracking down on insurance companies so that they actually pay the claims that they have promised, and going after the drug companies to make sure that we are negotiating for the cheapest available price on drugs, and investing in prevention so that Everybody's getting regular checkups and, and, and regular screenings so that they don't go to the emergency room after they've gotten sick, but we prevent them from getting sick in the first place. <laughs> Under my proposal, we are going to cut costs for families if they, you've already got health insurance. And if you don't have health insurance, we are going to make sure you get a plan that is at least as good as the plan I have as a member of Congress. And we're not going to wait 20 years from now to do it, or 10 years from now to do it. We'll do it by the end of my first term as President of the United States of America. We 
can, uh, we can choose to do nothing about disappearing jobs and shuttered factories all across America, or we can encourage job creation right here in America, which means we stop giving tax breaks to companies that are shipping jobs overseas, give those tax breaks to companies that are investing right here in the United States, right here in Missouri. It means making sure that our trade deals are good for everybody and not just for corporate profits, and that we're enforcing our trade deals when other countries are trying to take advantage of us. We can create two million new jobs by reinvesting in our infrastructure. Think about it. If we're spending 10 to $12 billion a month in Iraq, you can't tell me we can't invest some billions of dollars to rebuild our roads and our bridges and our schools and our hospitals and our sewer lines right here in the United States of America. We can keep on, we can keep on having the same old tired, stale arguments about education, or we can actually decide we're going to provide a world-class education for every child. Instead of, instead of having slogans like no child left behind and then leaving the money behind, we can actually invest in early childhood education to close the achievement gap. And we can pay our teachers more money and give them more support. And I want our young people, every single one of them, to be able to go to college. So we're going to provide a $4,000 tuition credit every student every year in exchange for national service so that we invest in them, they invest in America, joining the Peace Corps, working in a veteran's home, teaching in an underserved school. That's the way we're going to move this country forward. And, and we can start finally doing something about our energy crisis. I, I know, I know uh, gas prices have gone down. It's, it's a grand bargain now, $3.95. $3.95. On, on my way over here, George Bush was on TV talking about his energy plan. Now think about it. Where has George Bush been over the last eight years? Where was John McCain over the last 25? When I wanted to raise fuel efficiency standards on cars, he said no. When we talked about investing in alternative energy and biofuels, he said no. And now, suddenly, they've got the answer. We're going to drill for more oil. Now, let me say this. First of all, you've got oil companies making record profits. No, 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 no companies in history have made the kinds of profits the oil companies are making right now. They, they made 11 billion. One company, ExxonMobil, made 11 billion dollars, billion with a B, last quarter. They made $11 billion the quarter before that, making money hand over fist, making out like bandits. Now, John McCain's idea first was to suspend the gas tax, which would have given you 30 cents a day for three months for a grand total of $28 in savings. That is if if the oil companies actually lowered their prices at the pump. Of course, if they didn't, that just meant they were going to pocket that extra $28. So that, everybody said that was a bad idea. Now the latest scheme is, well, we're going to drill offshore. Now, I want to be absolutely clear to everybody about this. If I thought that I could provide you some immediate relief on gas prices by drilling off the shores of California and New Jersey. I understand how desperate folks are. I, mean, I, I met a guy who couldn't go on a job search, had lost his job, couldn't go on a job search because of 
the high price of gas. Just couldn't fill up his tank. I, I, I met a teacher in, in South Dakota who loved her job as a teacher on an Indian reservation. She had to quit because the drive was too far. She, it was taking up too much of her paycheck. I know how bad people are hurting. So if I thought that by drilling offshore we could solve our problem, I'd do it. But here's the problem. We have 3% of the world's proven oil reserves. We consume 25% of the world's oil. The oil companies right now have 68 million acres of leases that they are not using. They are holding land that they are not drilling, and now they want to get some more. And we've got no guarantee that they're going to actually end up using it. And if they did drill it, there's, there's no law out there that says that the oil is only used by Americans. So it ends up going on the world oil market. China ends up buying it. India ends up buying it. And you would not see a drop of oil for 10 years. The soonest you would see a single drop of oil from any drilling off our shores would be 10 years from now. Full production wouldn't start till 20 years from now. And the most you would end up saving 10 years or 20 years from now would be a few cents on the gallon. Although at that point, I figured oil, gasoline might be $12 a gallon. <laughs> Who knows what it might be? The point is, this is, this is not real. I, I know it's tempting. The polls say the majority of Americans think that that's one of the ways we're going to solve this problem. But it's not real. And, and this is what Washington does. It pats you on the back and says, we're going to do something. And in the meantime, the oil companies are shoving this thing down the throats of Congress because they know everybody wants to try to pretend like they're doing something about the energy crisis. And they end up making out like bandits again. So we don't need the same old tired answers. What we need is something new. So what I've said is, first of all, let's make the oil companies drill where they've already got leases, since we've given it to them. Let's increase supply by making them do what they're supposed to do. Let's look at the oil speculators and make sure that the markets aren't being manipulated. And let's get serious about alternative energy. Let's get serious about solar and wind and biodiesel. Let's raise fuel efficiency standards on cars. Let's get plug-in hybrids all across America. Let's finally free ourselves from dependence on foreign oil. That's the direction we need to go. So those are the choices we face in November. We can choose to remain on the path that's gotten into so much trouble, or we can decide to try something new. You know, I, I recognize Claire mentioned you know, what they say. Well, one, the main argument they've got in this election, let's, let's face it, there, there, no, nobody here thinks that, that uh, John McCain's got a real new idea about how we're going to solve our country's problems. <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, for the last two well, two months, all they've been doing is attacking me, right? Every ad, you know, his last ad, he, he was blaming me for high oil, uh, high gas prices. <laughs> so, so nobody really thinks that, that, that Bush or McCain have a, a real answer for the challenges we face. So what they're going to try to do is make you scared of me. You know, he, oh, he's not patriotic enough. He's got a funny name. He, you know, he doesn't look like all those other presidents on those dollar bills, you know? That's... He's risky. That's the argument. That's the argument that they're... That's essentially the argument they're making. It's like, the argument is, I, I know you don't really like what we're doing, but he's risky. <laughs> uh, seriously, right, Claire? I mean, that's basically the argument. 
It's like, well, we don't have much to offer, but he's risking. <laughs> and and, 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 and let, me just, let me just say this. It's true that change, change is, is hard. Change isn't easy. You know, and, and the question you have to ask yourself is, what's more risky? Going ahead and, and bringing about changes that we know we have to make in order to assure that our children have a better future, yeah. or doing the same things that we've been doing over and over again, even though we, don't, we know they don't work. On, you know, it is, we are in a time right now where it is too risky not to change. Yeah. It is risky to keep on doing what we're doing, to, to accept the tired status quo. got to reclaim the idea that in this country, we are always willing to change to make life better. That's what America's been about. That's what built America. That's why people went west. That's why immigrants came to our shores, because we were looking for towards that new horizon. In the end, that's what all Americans are asking for. They're not looking for guarantees. What they're looking for is that if they're able and willing to work hard, they can find a job that pays a living wage that they won't be bankrupt when they get sick, that they will be able to send their kids to a good school and send them to college even if they're not wealthy, that they're going to be able to retire with some dignity and respect. Americans believe in independence. They believe in self-reliance. They are not looking for government to solve all their problems, but they do expect government to help, and they do expect that when we have big, difficult challenges, that we've got bold, serious, proposals for action. That's what I'm offering in this election. That's what's at stake in this election. That's why I need Springfield, Missouri to support me in this election. Let's go bring about the changes that are going to make life better for the children of America. Thank you very much, everybody. God bless you. God bless America.